When I decided to be a curator, I think that was a kind of gradual uh, realization that I came to through during doing internships. And so, you know, you get to observe how other curators do their job. So I don't think I had a preconception about what curators do um, and that my sense of what the job could entail was really based on observation of these, uh, you know, of these mentors that I had in the field. What is an art curator? Museums can be magical places. There are so many paintings, statues, and objects that come from the past and illustrate humans' history. But there are also works that have been produced simply to show the beauty of things. However, we rarely think of how these pieces of work wind up in museums. The way a museum is organized and what it chooses to display is not trivial. It's the work of an art curator. So we are at the Florence Griswold Museum uh, in Old Lyme, Connecticut. It's right on the shore of Long Island Sound, and it's a place where at the turn of the 20th century there was a colony for artists to visit when they wanted to paint in the countryside outside of New York or outside of Boston. Um, the room that we're standing in was used as a dining room during the colony years. This was a boarding house that was run by Florence Griswold uh, for artists who found her and really enjoyed her hospitality. They made a wonderful connection and that led to her um, hosting an art colony on, in this site uh, for several decades. And um, in tribute to her encouragement of the artists and the way that she nurtured them, her artist friends helped turn this home into a museum after she died. And it has grown over the years to focus not just on the work that artists did here, but also the arts of Connecticut. So we have a historic house where we show the works of the Lime Art Colony members and also a gallery for changing exhibitions where we show the works of, uh, of Connecticut artists. Amy Kurtz Lansing is the art curator at the Florence Griswold Museum. I came to uh, being a curator out of being really interested in art and culture. So I didn't know what curators did when I was a kid. Uh, I did visit museums thanks to my grandmother who was a teacher and I was always really interested in the liberal arts, in um, literature and um, history and, um, and culture generally. And I always liked going to museum exhibitions but never thought about where they came from. And then when I was in high school, I had an art teacher who took part of our class sessions and taught us about art history. And I felt like, um, you know, it was just a revelation to encounter a topic that I thought really was like the uber liberal art. You know, art seems like it's sort of a culmination of all of the ideas and strains that are going on in a culture. And, you know, to find a, a way of studying art that um, helped me bring that all together was really magical. So I went to college um, to study art history. Um, and I, I learned about being a curator through internships um, that I had as a student at the Metropolitan Museum of Art and other places. And I thought that I would go into academia, but I really realized I liked the collaborative aspect of museum work and the fact that um, it's about making art accessible to the public. And so that's how I ended up following the path into being a museum curator. Okay, so what does an art curator do? I think in part that answer depends on what kind of museum you work at. You know, there are art curators in all different kinds of organizations, uh, in museums that don't have collections and just exhibit works of art. And so, but really broadly, I think curators' job is to make uh, art accessible to the public. I think that they are a kind of uh, a translator between artists, whether they're living or, or deceased, and the public today. And so I think that they can do that um, by bringing works of art before the public in terms of of, uh, exhibitions, collections that they build um, by doing research. You know, uh, there is a certain expertise that curators build up that I think enables them to help connect people to art. So I really, you know, I think the word curator, you know, can relate to um, this idea of caring for things or making choices and discerning, you know, what art is worthy of being seen. But for me, a curator is really a facilitator. The Florence Griswold Museum is a local structure which means that the way it operates can be different than bigger cities' museums. However, no matter the size of a museum, there is no typical days for art curators. 
in a way, I would say that there is not a typical day, which is one of the things about this job. Um, is but you know, you know, of course, there is a routine. You know, we have because this is I'm working as a curator in a museum. We usually um, talk as a senior staff every morning about what's going to be happening. We have all kinds of things going on in the museum, so you know, the curator can be as involved uh, in planning things related to art, but also as involved in you know um, helping prepare a mailing for development or wording to go into that mailing or something like that, helping make, you know, run a lecture. Um, so on a typical day, um, you know, there's uh, a lot of our work is uh, kind of about interacting with the public. So um, we sometimes do press, like the discussion I'm uh, doing right now. We uh, work with volunteers who do research on our behalf. We answer questions from the public, whether it's visitors who want some kind of supplemental information when they come here or send us queries or call us on the phone. Um, you know, so part of our day is sort of spent kind of uh, like in service to helping people uh, with their questions that they have about art, and in case, the case of this museum also about local history. Um, we talk with other curators and with other artists. Uh, we sometimes run lecture programs, uh, you know, online or in person, um, give tours uh, of exhibitions or for special groups that come to the museum. Uh, you know, so we don't have days that are uh, de devoted um, just to one task. You know, we are, can also be very hands-on here. That depends uh, on what kind of museum you're at, but we actually help install the exhibitions uh, and do a lot of kind of hands-on work, um, putting up art. Um, and then some days, you know, if you're thinking about building your collection, you might be out uh, visiting art collectors or going to um, galleries. Uh, we spend time um, interacting with other museums so we can keep up on the field, going to conferences. So there's a lot of different aspects um, to this job, uh, and some of them are really kind of, um, you know, require a lot of quiet time and focus. There's writing, but there's also a lot of public interaction as well. I think um, if you work at a small museum, you know, there's this expression that you wear more hats. I think that if you are a curator in a larger museum, you may be more focused in the work of your department and part of a bigger hierarchy where not as many of those hats are worn by each individual employee. Um, and there often is more of a research focus, uh, you know, at larger museums, I, you know, maybe fantasy, but my perception is that they have more time uh, to plan exhibitions or long longer lead times to plan exhibitions um, and um you know, but being a curator at a smaller museum, you're sort of more um, at the grassroots interacting, with, you know, with the public as well as, you know, with colleagues in the field. One of my favorite things to do as an art curator is actually research. I love the kind of piecing together of historical information uh, and the kind of detective work that can go along with being a curator, um, figuring out what things are, what they might depict, you know, uh, so much, there, there can be a lot known about something, but but, you know, you can always discover and find out more. So I really enjoy research. And um, one thing I didn't necessarily know uh, in, before coming into a job like this one is that I also really like working with contemporary artists. So my background is really kind of as a historian, uh, but, in, um, but I've also ended up doing a lot of projects uh, with artists working today. And so it's, it's, uh, that's a really enjoyable part as well to sort of um, hear from artists themselves as opposed to um, reconstructing uh, 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 information about their process, uh, you know, or their thoughts, uh, you know, to work with them directly and to be a kind of facilitator that helps their work reach the public. We're in an exhibition um, that I have just loved curating. It's an exhibition about a pop artist whose name is Leo Jensen, who contributed really to the development of pop art in the early 1960s. He's a contemporary of Warhol, um, and his contribution to pop was through really kinetic works of art, big uh, um, light up works, uh, spinning games,
games and um, a lot of really fun work that um, looks at and comments on the popular culture of America in the early 1960s. And he is an artist who moved out to Connecticut uh, and, and built his career from there. And this exhibition is the first of his work uh, to happen in, um, in decades. And so um, he was uh, an irreverent artist. He liked kind of poking fun at contemporary culture. So his work is also a lot of fun as well as um, really culturally insightful. One of the things when you're planning an exhibition is you want to figure out what's the best way to tell your story because essentially an exhibition is a story told through works of art. Um, and so how do they make a point visually? How do they create a visual narrative? You know, you don't just want the, the big ideas of the exhibition to be something that is being, you know, conveyed in words on the wall. And so um, in the case of a, an artist like Leo Jensen, where we're really trying to cover a lot of his career, it takes a lot of work looking at his work and trying to figure out, you know, in addition to chronology, how do these works cohere together? What show his major shifts in thinking or exciting new ideas that he was having? Um, how can you group works in a way that give you a sense of what his strong interests were? Um, when did he change from one idea to another? Um, you know, what are really landmark important works in his career? Ones that he felt really moved the needle for him or that had an important um, exhibition or publication history. And so all of those things are things that we take into account account and then you have to sort of fit those into um, the, the kind of the actual physical space of your gallery. How are you going to tell a story in the amount of wall space or floor space that you have? You know, where do you have runway to get big ideas going and where do you have to focus on kind of smaller chunks of a story? Because of course you, people are um, navigating this subject in physical space as well. So it's, it's a really fascinating process where you're delving deep into an archive but also thinking about, you know, the audience on the other end end of things that really won't know anything about this artist and what will they need or want to know when they encounter every single piece in the show as well as this name of, of, of an artist they likely uh, haven't heard before. Ideas for exhibitions can come from lots of different places. In the case of Leo Jensen, um, he is uh, a, a, sort of a unique uh, Connecticut artist in one sense in that he created some monumental sculptures for a big bridge that is near here that are very playful frogs that sit on a bridge um, um, in the town of Willimantic, Connecticut. Um, and so he's known in this area and um, his work, you know, is sort of known to us from that. And then his widow, uh, the artist Dahlia Ramanaskis, worked with us to develop this exhibition from pieces in his estate. And so, you know, as a curator, you're always trying to sort of um, cultivate potential exhibition topics. Sometimes you come upon a trove of work or a relationship that you can have as an artist family. That could be a great way to develop an exhibition topic. Other times you're working from your collection and that's increasingly a focus for museums. It's more economical to do that and it also really relates to the idea that if museums have accumulated, you know, in their storerooms uh, all these works of art, you know, shouldn't, shouldn't they be there so that they can be shared with the public and interpreted? So uh, some of exhibition planning can be delving into your own collection and, and coming up with ideas that relate to what is, is going on in the contemporary culture. So for example, um, when the pandemic began a few years ago, uh, we developed the idea for an exhibition called Social and Solitary, which delved into our collection to look at and contrast um, ways that art sort of expresses a, a desire for people to socialize and then how they also confront um, solitude. And, you know, because those are, um, those are sort of, uh, you know, things that everybody was encountering in their daily lives, you know, for the, especially in the early part of the pandemic. And then it ended up being, you know, in my opinion, quite a powerful exhibition, and I think really one of the first, because we were able to get it off the ground fairly quickly, um, you know, really one of the first shows to kind of, um, you know, to deal with that. And I think coming, being able to come and see that show gave people a way to sort of process some of the experiences that they had been having and to relate the art to their contemporary lives, which is just a wonderful um, kind of feat when an exhibition can do that. So for me, the power of art is that, uh, you know, is that it really connects us to who we are, um, both as individuals, but also who we are as a culture and who we were in the past. Uh, I think it's something that is just an innate um, human expression. People have been making art, you know, for millennia and I think always will. And so I think we should encounter art because it gives us a better understanding of ourselves as human beings.
What happens to art pieces when an exhibition is over can depend on where they come from. So if they're our collection, we, they either go back into storage or they get remixed and put into a longer term, more permanent installation, um, or they can be put in a new temporary exhibition. Um, if there are works that we have borrowed, they have to be carefully packed up and returned to their lenders, whether that's one person or whether it's you know a dozen, two dozen different museums. So sometimes the logistics of, um, of implementing an exhibition is very complicated because pieces can co be coming from all different places. Every work of art is unique. They can have a lot of different um, challenges or requirements at, based on the kind of materials that they're made out of. Sometimes museums send conservators or couriers with the work to make sure that everything is okay with them and you know they're installed the right way. So you know what you're looking at um, in an exhibition like this one is whenever all of those steps have been completed. But there's a lot of conservation, a lot of pre-planning, a lot of mapping things out both before the show and afterwards to get everything safely here, have it on view safely, and then safely back where it goes. What's next for us here is actually a, a, an exhibition from our collection. Uh, we are a museum that was visited by American Impressionists, and this is the 150th anniversary of the first exhibition of the works that now, we now call Impressionists in France. And so we are going to be um, doing a sort of a, a, an exhibition from our collection that looks at that, uh, that emergence of Impressionism, how artists who ended up um, working in that style in America, uh, what they took from their experience in France and, and where they took that when they came uh, back to this country um, and how Impressionism has kind of risen and fallen over the years as well as what some new directions of research and inquiry are about Impressionism, which is a topic people may have feel that they have seen everything that they ever could about, but trust me, there is still more to learn and new ways to think about it. So that is what's coming up here and what I'm working on for the for an exhibition this summer. So why should people know more about what curators do? I, you know, I think art is very much part of our world. Many people create artworks um, and so people should know what curators do because I think we should um, both know how to care for our material heritage and the things that we find and encounter around ourselves. We should care about, uh, you know, things that have survived from the past, we should care about making art and nurture our own creativity. And I think curators, um, you know, can play into that as well. Um, and I think that they should care about what curators do um, and add to their ranks because I think curators are people who help us kind of interpret um, the world that we live in as it's expressed in art. And, and, you know, kind of understanding where we're coming from, where we are, I think is a really valuable role. Um, not unlike um, the role that the teachers play in connecting people people with a greater knowledge and understanding of their world. My advice to people who want to become art curators is that they really learn deeply about art, that they hone their visual skills, that they learn to be really observant. Um, it's important to be detail-oriented. It's also important to hone your ability to interact with people of all different kinds. You know, you end up uh, working with artists' families, with children, with donors, um, you know, so to sort of develop those people's skills as well. You don't have to be an artist. Artist. People often ask me that question, uh, are you an artist? I, I, I think that gives you a really unique perspective um, as a curator and it's certainly really helpful to um, work with materials even if you don't consider the output wonderful, but to really understand how art is made I think uh, you know, is important for curators. But I think um, a sort of willingness to interact with lots of people and to really uh, develop a solid knowledge uh, you know, of art uh, is probably the most important trait. You know, of course, for individual curators, there could be the, um, you might need to know and study different languages, uh, you know, and then just build a broad knowledge of culture for yourself. Be curious, you know, just artists themselves, you know, have those traits and I think curators can learn from them in the sort of voracious way that artists take in the world. We can, we can learn to do the same things and be better curators for it. Thanks for watching. I hope you enjoyed the video. Seeking out positive content is a choice and it's an investment in self-care. I know that what I feed my head directly influences how I think and feel. Travel, photography, and uplifting quotations are three ways I maintain perspective, focus on the moment at hand, and see the beauty in the everyday. 
These pastimes all came together for me in a digital 365 day perpetual calendar I created. The images featured include poignant and compelling portraits, still lifes, and scenes that span every ecosystem. Those quoted represent a breadth of cultures and spiritual movements. Timeless insights are from philosophers, political leaders, writers, comedians, musicians, poets, artists, and others from the BC era to today. This digital 365 day perpetual calendar features observations on themes such as attitude, belonging, creativity, culture, mindfulness, nature, and spirituality, among many others. Make an investment in positivity and buy your copy today. Your purchase will help support the Flip the Lens channel. Thanks.